All right. Welcome, everyone, to another author chat on SFF Addicts. And today I have the absolute pleasure of talking with Becky Chambers. She is a science fiction author, keeper of bees, and gazer of stars. And she is best known for her Hugo Award winning Wayfarer series, which include The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, A Closed in Common Orbit, Re Record of a Space Born Few, and The Galaxy and the Ground Within. And her latest series is Monk and Robot, which started last year with the Psalm for the Wild Built and continues with the soon-to-be-released A Prayer for the Crown Shy out on July 12th. So welcome to the show, Becky. How are you today? Thank you. Uh, I'm doing very well. I'm excited to be here. Oh, thank you. Me too. And uh, before kicking things off, I want to say congratulations on the upcoming release of A Prayer for the Crown Shy. So what has the response been like with this new series, and how are you feeling about it all? Oh, it's fantastic. Um, I, I've been... Uh just so happy that this this series has been as well received as it is um i was nervous a little bit about um coming out with it because it's so different from wayfarers and i had just wrapped up wayfarers when monk and robot came out um and i'd done uh, i have a standalone novella that came out while i was writing wayfarers as well but you know, it's it's the bittersweet feeling of wrapping up something that mm -hmm. you've been doing for a long time, coupled with the the terror of, oh God, what if people don't like new thing? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but people have liked new thing, and that's that's makes me very excited. And um, I think also I've been um, it's it's difficult for me to talk about you know uh, the letters I get and whatnot. I'm very yeah. um, I'm very private, and and I have to. Uh, I have to really work at being able to talk about compliments that people give me because I get mm -hmm. a little bit tongue tied. <laughs> but I will say that I have received um, some uh, just uh, bushels of really wonderful notes from people who um, who, who seem to uh, really take some some comfort out of this uh, the first book in the series. Um, you know, throughout lockdown and whatnot, and that I think is. Um, just uh, you know, one of the most tremendous compliments I can I can think of. I'm glad that mm -hmm. it it found a good home with people um, in a time in which folks seem to have needed it. So see, look at that. I got through it without getting tongue tied. That's progress <laughs> and growth. Good job. On my part. And from Thank my you. part, I can say you know, just with everything that everyone around the world has experienced in the last couple of years, it's like it's really nice to just have a a, a story that that I can summarize as like a warm cup of tea kind of thing you know and and i think that's really yeah i mean that was that was just beautiful largely the in yeah thank you um that i mean that was largely the intent when i started it which was of course before people started getting sick mm -hmm. um but you know even at that point you know just with everything that was going on politically environmentally just everything everyone i knew was myself included was just toast you know we were just tired and angry and frustrated all the time and i noticed a lot of us doing this thing where you know we're living in this sort of golden age of just the the, the amount of media and popular culture that there is to consume you, right. we're definitely not living in a drought right like and you, there is <laughs> so much stuff out there and we would all talk about like oh yeah i really want to go you know I, that, that's on my list i've been meaning to check that out i've heard really good things about that series and all of us would go watch like great british bake off or cartoons or like shows we grew up with in the 90s you know like everybody yeah. was turning to comfort food and um but the thing about that is like especially especially when it comes to like kids media or media that's friendly for all ages absolutely nothing wrong with adults consuming that that's mm -hmm. great but i found that i was like i i want something to, that speaks to where i'm at right now but i also want something that's comforting and it's really hard to find that i think that we sure. so often uh, conflate um, cynicism with sophistication. And so, you know, if you're going to watch a grown up show, it's probably going to be kind of dark and it's going to be bittersweet. I mean, not universally, but that that is what you get a lot of yeah. the time. And I was like, what would the equivalent, what, you know, can is there an adult, a grown up equivalent of a story I could tell in which it gives you the same sort of feeling of I'm going to sit around and watch cartoons this afternoon, but it is actually for adults. It is for you right now in, you know, like it, it has material that you can engage with and, you know, will give you lots to think about. And um, I hate using the word mature because that sounds 
demeaning towards the other <laughs> work. But I mean, you know, it's a it's it's the sort of thing that tries to speak to you where you're at right now. And um, that was that was a large part of the impetus to uh, to write these books in the first place. Oh, and it's beautiful. And I mean, it fits for everything that that we've we've had dumped on us in the last few years. And, and I think comfort food is a really good way to way to put it. Um, and, you know, I do want to get into the series a bit more and we can dish about it all we all we want. But uh, first, I like to ask uh, this at the beginning, just to give, uh, you know, viewers, listeners a better sense of, of you and your relationship with uh, science fiction and fantasy. So for you as a kid uh, growing up, what was it like in terms of reading and SFF? Totally. Um, I, I was a voracious reader as a kid. I was the kid who would go up at the, to the library checkout desk with like an obnoxiously large <laughs> stack of paperbacks. Yeah. And then I'd be back a week later. Um, I was much more of a fantasy reader when I was young. I think that, oh, cool. I think that that's fairly common for, for kids to fall more into fantasy, at least when you're, yeah. when you're younger. And then in my teens as well, I definitely gravitated more toward fantasy. I think because as a woman at the time, um, you know, coming in, you know, this would have been in the late nineties. Um, the, the works that were available then, um, again, not a blanket statement, but the things that I would find on library shelves or at my school or whatnot. Um, you know, if I looked at science fiction and fantasy, the fantasy side of things felt more welcoming to me as a girl. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas the sci-fi side of things, there was definitely sci-fi that I read and enjoyed, but a lot of it, you know, I'd pick up the cover and it'd be some like pulpy thing with, you know, a dude with a laser gun and, you know, some, some buxom green lady. Bodacious. And I'd be like, that's not <laughs> right. I'd be like, that's not, it's clearly not for me. Yeah. Um, but then, um, I, uh, one of my teachers, um, handed me the left hand of darkness and Ooh, said, I think wow. you really like this. And Le Guin was, uh, my gateway into not just enjoying this stuff, but wanting to write it myself. Like her work was really what sort of flicked this light switch for me of like, oh my God, this is what science fiction can be. This is allowed. Like, this is amazing. Um, and because the thing of it was, I was also consuming the science fiction that I was consuming at that time wasn't in books. It was on TV. I grew up with Star Trek. Yeah, uh, Next Generation aired when I was three years old and I watched it every week all the way through Voyager. So that, that, <laughs> that franchise raised me. Um, I watched Star Wars, of course. The original trilogy was a really big thing for me um, as a kid. And so, like, that, the love of that was there. But I really didn't know to, to you know, I hadn't been taught yet how to think critically about it and to dissect the stories I was, I was consuming. I loved the idea of, of stories in space, but I really wasn't reading them um, habitually mm -hmm. until Le Guin. Um, and that was that. Was that. After that point, I was just like, okay, this is, this is where it's at. Like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Cause I mean, it was very similar for me. I mean, just even on my part being a guy growing up, fantasy just had more of like a, I guess it's like the, the, the wondrous imagination on the fantasy side of things might be a more, um, approachable for a younger person to be able to, uh, understand or relate to where science fiction uh, a lot of the time tends to have a bit more of a of a barrier to entry when it comes to its imaginative uh, portrayals. And yeah, totally just, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the sci-fi that I, that I consumed was watching it. But it's really amazing that that someone like Le Guin was that bridge for you because she also bridged the gap between fantasy and science fiction uh, for many, many decades as well. And so, you know, with that inspiration, with mm -hmm. that influence, how did you then catapult that into wanting to write yourself and actually starting to write yourself. So I, you know, I've always, I've always been a writer, like ever since I was a little kid, like that's always been my preferred way of expressing myself. It's just, it's, mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine not doing it. Um, but I didn't really, um, consider writing professionally until, um, my early twenties. I actually, I studied theater in school and I worked in theater for, for a few years. Um, but I, I I became aware of this thing that was happening where my coworkers, my colleagues at the theater I worked at, when 
work was over, they would all go to watch other shows. Like we've just done a show, but like oh, wow. they would go to one act festivals. They would go to, you know, like mm-hmm. little indie stuff. They would go, you know, over to a friend's house to work on a script together, that kind of thing. Whereas I would go home and play video games and watch Star Trek. And that, <laughs> and after a while I found myself feeling dissatisfied in the, the, the work I was doing in theater. And I, I really, you know, did some navel gazing about that. And I was yeah. like, I don't think the stories I'm interested in are taking place in the medium that I'm employed in right now. Right. I think I need to pay attention to the fact that what I am drawn to, what gives, what gives me feelings, what gives me joy is the video games I'm playing and the books I'm reading and, mm. you know, the TV I'm watching. I think that's the sandbox that, I need to go play in because that's where my heart is, you know? So, um, I very consciously made the switch to writing. I did freelance for a long time. Um, you know, worked it, worked in the content mines and, um, (laughs) you know, like it was a lot, the, the first, the first five, six years of it was really a grind. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then, then eventually, eventually I wrote, the long way to a small angry planet and and now we're talking so, <laughs> so. well all these years later how did that how did that uh that idea for long way to a small angry planet sort of ruminate during these grind years work in the the content work in the content minds as you say <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> it actually started even before that um i so when i was in college i had uh, an incredibly boring job on campus, I worked uh, at the gym, and I'm not a gym person at all. But I worked at the front desk of the gym, and uh, I worked the morning shift. Like my job was to check in the people who who like to go to a gym at six in the morning. Mm-hmm. And absolutely none of those things is true for me. I d- I'm not a morning <laughs> person. <laughs> I don't work out. But somehow that was where I was at at six in the morning for most of college. So um, it was incredibly boring. All I would do is just swipe these cards. And I promise this is relevant to your question. But (laughs) I got in trouble. I got in trouble with my boss because um, I would read while at the desk, but I would get really sucked into it because, you know, books. And I got in trouble because um, sometimes people would come up to the desk and I wouldn't notice them there Mm. because my nose was in a book. And so I was told that I needed to stop reading so that I could be more attentive. And I was Ah, like, fine. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Uh, So instead, what I figured out is that I could write while I was at work, because if I was writing in a notebook, it looked like I was doing something. (laughs) which I was absolutely not, but I was, that's what I would do. She's and so, so this one, Wow. Wow. Look at her. She's so like on it. No, uh, it was not. And so this one day I was just bored and making up aliens as one does. And, um, I wrote this little character sketch of, uh, this woman who belonged to a reptilian sort of species, just as sort of a, uh, a proof of concept of what this species might look like. And I really liked her. I like, I was like, I, I like her a lot. I think she's neat. I think she needs some friends. So I wrote her some friends and then I was like, they need a job. And I was like, well, obviously they all live on a spaceship, but what kind of spaceship? What does this spaceship do? And it just snowballed from there. I mean, that, that character was Sissix and the rest were the crew of the Wayfarer. And, Um, they just lived in my head for a good seven years before I actually sat down to write. And I would write stories about them all the time. And I had a literal shoebox full of like note filled up notebooks and pieces of scratch paper and all of this, all of the stuff that went into the world building for the Galactic Commons. Um, but for a long time, I, I didn't think it was a real book, quote unquote, um, because there wasn't, you know, it kind of makes me laugh thinking back on it now because now I've, I'm like, you don't need plot. You're fine. Um, but <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I thought to myself, I'm like, this isn't a real book because it doesn't feel like real science fiction. There's no chosen one. There's no heroes. Nothing's blowing up. We're not saving the galaxy. All I have are these little stories about people just living their lives. Um, and it really hamstrung me for a long time of being able to actually start with it. And yet I kept 
tweaking it. You know, I kept writing stories about these people. I kept thinking about it. They were always right there. Um, and it was actually, it was actually, again, Le Guin that, that gave me the push I needed because, um, there's a book of hers called changing planes, which is my yes, favorite of hers. So it's good. a, yes, yes. Oh. It's a, it's a short story collection. And really that too is just a bunch of little stories that are all proof of concept. Nothing happens in this book in the best possible way. You are just traveling from like your dimension, dimension hopping from different worlds. You just get these descriptions of who these people are and what this place is like. And then you're on to the next. I've read it a bazillion times. I had to buy a new copy last year because mine is falling apart. <laughs> and um, I thought about that. I thought about, you know, these knots I was tying myself in being like, oh, this isn't a real book. This isn't blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, so what is this other book then? This other book where nothing happens and it's just these pictures of people living their lives that you adore. Like, do you not want more books like that? Like, if you like that, someone else will like mm -hmm. your stuff. So... Stop being stupid and write this book. <laughs> so, I, so I did. And at the same time, it's like, um, even though there's not necessarily uh, a clear overarching plot or, you know, tropes mm -hmm. like the hero's journey or what have you, um, or even like the heroine's journey, there's, um, there's a comfort and a structure that comes in just like plopping yourself into someone else's head and life and kind of ruminating on what they're doing. And I think as a reader, obviously um, something that I've learned as I've, as I've grown older is that my imagination plays a huge part in, in, in the stuff that I'm reading. And so when I have such a character driven story where there's not such a clear through line of this is the plot and blah, 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 blah. And um, you know, these are the, the stakes and the expectations that you can, uh, you know, see being fulfilled by the end of this or what have you, my imagination starts to fill in all of these little holes. And then I become way more engaged in what's going on because I feel like I'm having some small part in the overarching narrative of this character's life. And for me, that is so engaging and I really love it. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I'm obviously incredibly biased here but yes i mean that so to me yeah the slice of life is beautiful right yeah, like i yeah. think um you know there 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 is so much space for stories that exist outside of the traditional three act like we're gonna build and build and build and build and then climax and day one and then like that's that's the yeah. story and the thing is there are a lot of stories that fit that model that i love you yeah. know and like not just classics from my childhood like contemporary stuff to this day like there is no wrong way to tell a story and there's nothing wrong with using a, a template that obviously works right but by that same token you can tell a story about anything you can tell a story about like someone who's just living on a spaceship and doesn't know what to cook for dinner and if you you can <laughs> turn that into an interesting story you know because like i personally when I think about the things in my life in the real world that I find most interesting or most captivating or, you know, the things I really pay attention to, they're all the most ordinary things. Life is interesting and you don't, and life also doesn't have a plot, yeah. right? So, and yet we're still fascinated by it. So I think not to say that you can just, you know, there, there is still, still obviously a process and a structure to it. Like you can't just be completely freeform with it either, yeah, but, yeah. um, but yeah, I don't think I, the the longer I do this, the more I just really find myself doubling down on on you know just how how much nothing can I get away with on the page, like in a way that's still <laughs> compelling. That's honestly what it comes down to for me. That was very much um, how I felt about the Galaxy in the Ground Within, which is the last novel in in Wayfarers, and it's definitely yeah. how I feel about Monk and Robot as well. It was just like that fear I had that kept me from writing the long way has completely evaporated and now just yeah. sort of almost out of spite. I'm like, let's see, let's <laughs> see. I bet, I bet I can keep you interested. I bet I can keep you interested, even though we're going to be as chill as possible here. Um, <laughs> and, you know, people's mileage may vary as to whether or not I pull that off. Of course. I mean, that's, that's part of the fun. Yeah, but I love how you're spitefully embracing the beauty of the mundane. It's like, yeah, fuck the haters. Yeah. I'm just going to do my thing. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just, this book's about tea. Deal with it. Like it's, you know, um, and honestly, I find, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the world at large and we don't have to dwell there because we're all, we're all intimately familiar with how dif oh, difficult yeah. the last few years have been. Um, but I, that too, I find often, often comes from a place of, um, sort of defiance or rebellion with me. I find like mm. the angrier I get about the world outside, the gentler I tend to write. Um, like mm. it, and it really is in this sort of like, you know, flipping a double bird to the world and being like, I'm sorry, I still think you're beautiful. And I still think that things can be better. <laughs> and I will just write something very cozy about that. Um, I tend to, I tend to write the stories that I need to be reading in that moment. And so that's a lot of it does come from <laughs> Like ironically, come from an angsty place. Um, these these gentle things I write, but um, you know, that's a that's, that's a beautiful fuel. channeling yes. though. It's like a lot of people just channel their anger or their angst in in very unproductive ways. So I'm I'm appreciative that you've come into this focus of being like, you know, I need peace, I need calm, I need ordinary, and how can I make that engaging? And how can I get people to love these characters and I think you've pulled that off completely, uh, you know, and that that's the kind of stuff that it's like, oh, good. That's like we mentioned comfort food earlier. It's like that's a nice bit mm -hmm. of comfort food in between all the all the, you know, stranger things and, and uh, you know, just high, more high octane or more stressful uh, content that, that mm -hmm. people are putting out there. Yeah. And I mean, the, here's the thing is that, yeah, I mean, the thing of that is I love stranger things. I love like. I love that kind of stuff too. And I think that's, that's the key with it is I don't see it as a zero sum game. You know, often yeah. when people talk about, um, you know, just the fact that we have this split between a uh, utopian science fiction and dystopian science fiction. And it's like, we don't have to argue about which is better or which is more useful. Sometimes the thing you need to write is just pure bile. Like sometimes you just need to be <laughs> angry and you just need to like lean into that and you need to be scary and gross. And that's legit. You know, you have to, purge that and and work through that and that can be healing it can mm -hmm. be every bit as healing as writing something peaceful and calm but i think you need both because yeah sometimes you just need to face your fears head on sometimes you need to escape sometimes you need a break and so i i that's what i i try to provide with my work is that's the niche that i see is that you know where i fit is okay if you need to if you need to go freak out for a while like you know, there's, a, there's a lot of yeah, like post-apocalyptic horror that's all there for you yeah if you need to just curl up and be quiet and we talk about escapism disparagingly but it's not it's rest you mm -hmm. know and we all need to rest you need to recharge if you are going to be able to go deal with all the really scary stuff that's outside you have yeah, to take a minute 100%. and you have to breathe and heal yeah yeah no i completely agree and you know after your I'm I'm curious after your long journey of sort of internal battling of like what is uh what is this book with the long a long way to a small angry planet after that ended up getting published and you were able to get into the sequels and eventually write two three four novels in that series and I think there's a, a novella in there as well um how did that how did that feel for you to be able to expand upon that first book build out the wayfarers universe and at the same time um what kind of ideas did it allow you to explore uh in terms of what you were dealing with personally or what was reflective of the world around yeah i think um you know as as mentioned uh i started thinking about wayfarers in my early 20s i was 2021 20, somewhere in there and then uh, I finished Galaxy in the Ground within shortly before I turned 36. So, I mean, that's a long time to hang out in in one particular setting. And so when I when I yeah. look at that series now and think about the work I did there, um, I really feel privileged and lucky that I got the opportunity not only to um, to continue writing in that setting, but that my publisher was very supportive with the second book when they came to me and said, you know, because The Long Way had done really well. It was, you know, it was, you know, out there doing its thing. And they were like, would you, would you like to write a sequel? And I, from the jump, said, I don't want it to be about the same crew. 
Like I don't have anything more for those characters. And I really, what I want to do is just keep exploring the different pockets of the galaxy that we haven't yet. And I felt that that stayed true to this idea of it being a slice of life. Because if you're just staying with the same people, you're not actually getting all the different perspectives. It's the same yeah. reason why I like playing with different points of view and I don't have a central protagonist. Um, I really want to give you a feeling for the, this particular point in time for, in this particular community. And I think the only way you can do that is by you know jumping from here to there. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful that... Um, they were supportive of that and gave me the space in which to do that because what it meant was that I never felt stuck and I never felt, you know, um, too locked in, be, you know, aside from the fact that like, you know, sure, there are things I came up with in my in my 20s that like mid 30s me was like, oh, come on, like, like, <laughs> I don't, uh, you know, but I had to work with it anyway. Um, but yeah, I see those books as very much me being in conversation with myself about what I thought made a book and what I, th what my, my thoughts about science fiction in general, if you, if you look at the long way to a small longer planet and the galaxy in the ground within next to each other, I actually very intentionally um, thought about the shift between early twenties, me and mid thirties, me while I was writing the right. galaxy in the ground within, because I did feel a bit hampered by some of the world building choices that I've made. I found myself um, interested in other things in the genre that I was feeling like, I'm not sure that this sandbox is giving me enough space to explore that. And so I decided to address those things through those characters. I, you know, I have characters who are like, this whole situation is messed up. Like this, you know, we're coming at it from the other side. Like, um, speaker, one of my characters who comes from a, a very marginalized species, um, in the galactic commons, um, you know, we don't actually get to see what that's like from their point of view until galaxy in the ground within. And I think a lot of the decisions I made about them, um, not that they weren't careful at the jump, but th they are things I would have handled differently now. And so it was actually kind of cathartic to be able to write a character who was talking to my younger self being like, Hey, like <laughs> this world you're building, this part's messed up. I don't like this. Um, yeah. and so, you know, that was an op I, I don't think I would have been able to tell a story that did that if I had just been locked into the same characters over and over again. So it did give me an enormous amount of freedom. Um, and yeah, I was really grateful for that. And it must've been so cathartic to, to just kind of have that conversation through the act of writing with your 20s self. And, and like you say, be like, this is a little bit constrained. Like what the fuck are you thinking? Or you, yeah. know, you weren't thinking big enough or what have you. And you know, I think it's, it's so fascinating that, that as a reader, you can kind of trace that journey, but then for you, you have this really, uh, personal, um, reflection on, on this whole universe that you created, all the books that you've written in that universe and the characters that you've, uh, been able to use as like, like you say, sort of platforms to have the conversations that you want to have with yourself, but also in, in relation to your life and, and, and the world and all that. And I think that's, that's beautiful. It's a, uh, it's just very, um, that that's like the, the treasure of, of the, the writing journey is just being able to, to see how you progress and to see how your stories evolve and, and everything like that. And from your perspective, it sounds like it happened really naturally, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think I think for me, that's the core of it, you know, as I love my job. I love what I do. I love. Um, yeah, it's really nice to have books on a shelf and to be <laughs> able to go, you know, I love being able to, you know, talk to readers and and, you know, the, the, that feeling of like, oh, this thing I thought up, other people know about it now. That's very cool. But for me, the the, the crux of it really is like I've joked to friends sometimes, like if I could just like sit in a cave and like hand things out the door in exchange for food and just do that forever. That'd be fine. Um, and that's no disrespect to any of the lovely folks I work with or have spoken to. But for, for me, the joy really is in just constantly picking at the things that come out of my head. And I never want to write the same thing twice. You know, yeah. because that what's the point of that? Like with mm -hmm. every book in Wayfarers, it was always 
all right, what's the, I would always give myself some sort of a challenge, you know, like, can you, you know, for, for the long way, it was just, um, can you write a book? You know, let's see, let's see if you can write a book <laughs> yeah. and close in common orbit was, um, all right, cool. You wrote a book. Can you do a more focused book with just two characters? Like you have this big cast with nine. Can you do a much more focused story with just two? Uh, Record of a Space Born Few was, can you write a story about multiple characters that have nothing to do with each other? Um, and uh, closing or Galaxy in the Ground Within was, all right, can you write a story can you can you write a satisfying space story that only takes place in, in one location because all these other ones like hop around what can you write a story about space that is actually not in space it's yeah. like an extremely <laughs> terrestrial story and you don't go anywhere and it's told in just this very small amount of time um as opposed to you know years or months or what have you as it takes place in the other books i was like no it's like it's like five days <laughs> can you write a book that <laughs> takes place in five days yeah. um and so that, there we go yeah I mean, I think it's cool that you gave yourself these uh, constraints because, you know, I've had conversations with friends about uh, the nature of creativity and how, um, you know, for me personally, my background, uh, you know, I kind of have this like dualistic thing of like writing, but then I was also an artist and a tattoo artist for many years. And so I, I kind of love the freedom that comes from constraint and it's like giving yourself you know in the case of a tattoo the constraint of skin and the biology of skin and how that uh really delegates like certain things are not possible so you have to navigate that uh those waters or with writing for instance it's like sometimes you have to give yourself those constraints in order to let your creativity blossom knowing that there's this like force pushing against you and be like you know just a very gentle like nudge to say hey hey you can't go this way uh or you know you told yourself you didn't want to do this and so i think that's a really smart way to have approached uh each book is like give yourself that 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 constraint to let your creativity flourish and and fulfill some personal goal in that sense yeah, ex that's it exactly. I mean, I think um, creativity does best with a few rules, right? You don't want it to feel you don't want it to mm -hmm. feel too boxed in. But yeah, there's something wonderful that happens when you when you take one crayon out of the box, right? Mm -hmm. When you say, "Up, oh, you can't have that one," but you know, or if you say, "Like you can only use blue." What are you going to do with that? You know, that's yeah. fun to me. You know, that that makes <laughs> my brain twist itself in all sorts of different ways, you know, um, because otherwise, if you're if you're completely free form, if you just kind of let yourself go for me personally, um, there's not really a challenge in that. And I don't know what mm -hmm. I'm doing. And I don't finish projects that way either, because I get so into the weeds that I'm just like, what? <laughs> what even is this <laughs> where we've ended up but if i always have something you know some little challenge i think it is in large part with me too part of my like video game brain because yeah. you know that is also something i massively enjoy is you know being able to do like optional challenges and games and stuff where it's like can you do this map again but uh you only use you know um melee weapons instead of ranged mm -hmm. weapons yes i'd love to try that show me you know that like that kind of thing <laughs> just sets me on fire so it's the it's the same thing just being able to play play little games with myself um yeah. is what keeps it interesting um and keeps me challenged but in a way that doesn't feel like a grind like if i give myself some kind of constraint or if there's kind of some kind of external constraint you know from you know in a in a publishing context or what have you mm -hmm. that is making you the writer feel like feel stressed out and feel like uh, i'm not really that's no good but if you if it's a challenge that makes you excited that's exactly what you should lean into yeah completely agree and I, it's like yeah just that drive that kind of pushes you to be like, fuck yeah, let's do this. And I mean, I mean, from like a gaming standpoint, sometimes yeah. it's like there are the, um, the, con like the, the sort of virtual barriers that the, the video game developers had to put in there from the context of like, yeah, everything beyond mm -hmm. that point is inaccessible because of, you know, processing power or, design time and and uh assets and all that kind of stuff uh but then there's just like the sadistic people i guess like us who are just like i'm gonna try and break this a little bit or i'm gonna try and like 
you know, yep. break the rules yep. of the I'm game. I'm going to try and to, like, get over that wall that I shouldn't. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or it's like, oh, I've there's no way so that I can climb this. I've so breaking games. Yeah, but it's so much fun. It's so much yep. fun. Uh, so and so fun. for you. Yeah, we could talk. We could talk. Of, I will. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go for it. Oh, I was just going to say, we could talk at length about this. So I'm grabbing myself by the collar and being like, no, we're not telling video game stories, right? <laughs> reel it in, reel it in, <laughs> Becky. <laughs> yep. Um, but you you mentioned at the beginning the the impetus for for Monk and Robot. But when you were approaching this 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 new project, you know, you don't like to repeat yourself. And so you finish the Wayfarer series and you're like, okay, I'm going to start something new. What were some of those like initial constraints or ideas that you had going into it? So, um, one of the things was I had just written, uh, the galaxy in the ground within, which is a story without any human characters whatsoever. And mm -hmm. so, well, I mean, there's like one, it doesn't matter. There's like a tiny <laughs> blip of humanity in there, but it's a very, it's a very alien book. Um, and then I was like, okay, no more aliens for a while. There's no aliens mm -hmm. on this planet. <laughs> and, um, I think also I wanted to play more in the the science fantasy side of the box because i it's not somewhere i'd been before you know wayfarers is you know very far future very typical uh, intentionally very typical sort of space opera setting in which you know you have bipedal aliens that you can sit down and have dinner with um you know i wanted it to follow the same rules of physics and biology as our world i wanted it to all feel possible right even if it's not probable, but I took a lot of leaps with it, you know? Um, but even so it was like, I'm always going to explain to you how this works and it's going to feel real. It's going to feel grounded. Um, and then, uh, with monk and robot, I said, okay, so this world works because I said, so that's it. That's the rule. This work world works because I said, so gods are real. Like there's, there's a moon called Panga. People have always lived there. That's where people live is this moon called Panga. And there are six gods there. And they're real. And one day all the robots w woke up and I'm not going to tell you how, because I don't know. It's not Who important. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't care. One day the, ro you know, and so it was actually really freeing um, to just write a story that, um, that I didn't have to really do a ton of research mm. for because it was all, you know, the stuff I'm, I've got in there about like um, renewable energy and green technology, that's all stuff I already knew. So I was just like, I just get to play fast and loose for a while and I don't have to reinvent biology for this. And like, I'm just, I'm just going to go on a little road trip. And it's funny because now the book I'm working on, which I cannot talk about too much because it's, you know, hasn't been announced yet and blah, blah, blah. But like now what I'm working on is like, super alien and super sciencey. <laughs> it's like I, I have this feeling I just have this pendulum in me that's gonna swing back and forth forever. Like as soon as I finish this, I'm sure yeah. I'm just gonna be like space lasers, fuck it, I don't care. Uh but you know <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's it's nice. It was really it was really refreshing actually to um to write something where there weren't spaceships for a bit. Much as I love spaceships, I adore spaceships, but it was it was nice to just uh go get my boots on the ground, so mm -hmm. to speak, and just hang out with people for a while. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and for you, you know, one of the core central things of this series so far, at least from my perspective, has been tea. So why was tea such an integral aspect of the story that, that you wanted to tell and like how that unfolded between this relationship of a, of a monk and a robot? Right. So I, first of all, just, you know, in my personal life, I love tea. I'm a big tea drinker. I have way too much of it downstairs, <laughs> um, but I love a cup of tea. And um, Nothing wrong with that. I was really <laughs> thinking about, <laughs> I was really thinking about um, that whole concept of, of small comforts, right? Mm. That whole thing that I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation about, uh, you know, watching a cartoon or an old favorite show for a little bit. It's nothing important. It's nothing that will change mm -hmm. your life, probably. I mean, it might be, but probably not. It's something you're putting on at the end of the day because you're tired and you need to rest a bit 
and you just you just need a break. You just need a real short break. And a cup of tea is very much the same thing. I feel like the way that tea fits into my day, you know, it's something where, you know, I'll go to make a pot of tea while I'm in the middle of work day. But that means that I am taking that time mm -hmm. to go and, you know, measure some leaves and boil some water and wait for it to steep. It's not much, but it can really turn my afternoon around. And so I, I thought that that fit the sort of vibe I was going for nicely. And in the same way that a book does, you know, a book isn't necessarily depends on the book, but a book isn't necessarily this big groundbreaking thing that's going to flip your whole worldview. It could be, but like, it can also just be, I'm tired and I'm going to take an afternoon and go somewhere else for a while. And then I'll feel rested enough to come back. It, it all went hand in hand for me. Um, and I didn't actually know, uh, so sibling Dex, who's the protagonist is a, is a traveling monk. Um, and they, they are a disciple of the God of small comforts. And so there are lots of different ways you can, um, work in service of that, but for them, it's serving tea. They go from village to village and, um, serve tea people there. And initially Dex wasn't a monk and they weren't, serving tea initially it was i think dex was like a some sort of a farmer or like a, they had this traveling seed library like mm -hmm. in in the wagon it was a seed library and they were going around swapping seeds and it just i i couldn't actually tell you when the switch was when i was like first of all this is a monk and second of all <laughs> it's tea actually like i think there was just something about not just providing something utilitarian i mean not that gardening isn't you know can't also be healing in its way but like something that really didn't have any tangible use outside of just you're going to sit for a bit, you're going to drink something warm and delicious, and then you can get about your day. And that, that mm -hmm. I, that doing that is not just important, but to these people, it's sacred it is sacred to rest. It is sacred to enjoy something. It is sacred to, to take a step back and connect with the physical world around you in a way that is pleasurable in a way that is, um, that makes you feel cared for. I don't know. I just all, all, all of that um, was really what I was trying to bake into the story as a whole. And so it just, once I landed on that, it all, it, it snowballed pretty quickly from there. That's awesome. And, you know, from my perspective, I, you know, something like tea or something like a book is very purposeful. It's a choice that you make in order to engage with something, whether it's the aromas that are wafting out of a cup of tea or the words on the page of a book. And then in the context of the world, for sure, like I totally get what you're what you're saying in the sense that it is a way to step back and engage with the world around and kind of ruminate a bit. But at the same time, it plays this kind of communal role where community is so important. and contact with other other people and conversation are very important and i think it's this kind of perfect uh parallel between the relationship of the of dex sibling dex and the the robot that they meet and how those two are kind of having these philosophical ruminations on what it means to be human and what it means to be part of a community and to engage with one another but at the same time engage with nature and the world around and so you know for you was it helpful to to have this um this project to creatively explore explore your you know ruminations on you know the philosophy of what it means to be human or the philosophy of nature or what it means to be a part of a community things like that Absolutely. Those were, those were all, all ideas I loved playing with. And mm -hmm. again, the fact that I was writing within a setting in which I didn't have to stop and figure out, okay, how do their gills work and how do, you know, I could just, <laughs> I could just, I, the thing is I love doing that work I do, but it was just so a nice to time. just sit and be like, right. they're just having a chat like by this river about death and like, that's, you know, like, um, you know, as we all do sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, one of the things, um, that I, I really loved playing with is in this, that, that I hadn't really gotten to explore so much of my other works with this. I, I commonly get into this fit of peak about, um, just polar opposites that are posed as like a, a strict binary in all respects. Um, but it, you know, the things like, um, 
nature and technology are so often depicted as opposing mm-hmm. forces, right? And this is very common in science fiction and also in in video games as well. You know, if you're dealing with a game that has yeah. like different factions, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, you've got like sort of the hippies over here and you've got the super tech people over here and they don't like each other. Um, I mean, I've I'm playing so uh, RPGs. right um, now. And- uh, I'm playing Horizon Forbidden West, and that game is so much about like how do people take the remnants of humanity's past and the technology and re uh, reorient it into this new world framework and like completely what you said. Yeah. There's always these dichotomies and all this kind of nuance there. I I, I haven't played Forbidden West yet uh, because I don't I play on PC not on console but I loved mm. Z- Horizon Zero Dawn. I loved it. It was so much fun. Um, But yeah, exactly that of these things are inherently opposed to each other. I don't believe that that's true. I believe that, you know, we are part of nature. Technology is just tools that we've created, like all apes create tools. And so it's just a matter of how we choose to use these things. They are not inherently enemies, you know? So there was that. And also this idea of, you know, the, 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 choosing to make the the robots interested in nature that they love nature that they want to be a part of nature um that too was you know th- these things don't have to exist in separate spheres um the fact that the religion of panga um the dexas religion um embraces both the spiritual and the scientific that these mm. things are that science is recognized as part of the spiritual as well i'm personally a secular person but it um that also has always bothered me because i have lots of friends of faith and friends who are not and the, the, that whole thing of like well science and religion polar us no they're not exactly. they're not polar opposites at all they can absolutely they are just two different ways of looking at the world and, and they've been intertwined the throughout conclusions. all of history right exactly there is no like uh so i feel like all all of these things that i that i get um <laughs> You know, that I get irked about. I could sit yeah. there and be like, no, it doesn't work like this here. Because <laughs> again, because I said so. Becky's angst at work again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, you know, beyond beyond the work that you're doing, what do you feel? Um, because I, I I read your stuff and I feel uh, you know, obviously there's there's like the philosophical aspects of it, the ways that you can kind of self-reflect on on you as a as a reader and a human being and a part of a community and a part of a world and that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's very hopeful. I feel like there's a surge recently in more optimistic uh science fiction and fantasy. And for you, how does it, you know, how does it feel personally to be sort of part of that space and to be pushing the um pushing the creative boundaries of uh what hopeful and positive science fiction and fantasy can be uh it's exhilarating honestly it's it's um just such a such a treat all the time every day um i you know when i wrote <laughs> the long way that was that was actually a big part of it was i wanted it to feel like a hopeful work i wanted it to feel like a future you could look forward to at the time when i was working on that and and this is still true but like grimdark was very much in vogue when i first started working on on wayfarers and i was tired of being afraid of the future i and i think that was i i saw these you know these parallel fears right like that like all the futures we were engaging with were just really dirty and gritty and uncomfortable and scary but also you know we were you know scared about climate change as Mm -hmm. we still are and you know just all these big existential threats that were looming and it just felt like we didn't have anything to look forward to you know there was nothing we could work toward and like how are you supposed to continue struggling through difficult times through strenuous times when you don't think that there's a light at the, you know, at the end of the horizon, like what, how are you supposed to, you know, motivate yourself to, to find the strength to continue on? If you don't think there is a better world that's possible, I might not see it, but somebody else might see it. And I'm going to keep working in pursuit of that. Um, that was a feeling that very much drove the long way and wayfarers. Um, it's definitely something, uh, that fueled me through monk and robot. Um, 
it, it, I just feel very similar to, to what I said about, you know, sometimes you just got to write an angry story and sometimes you're going to write mm-hmm. something cozy. I also feel, yeah, sometimes you, you just need to write something scary. Sometimes you just, you know, cautionary tales are important. They yeah. are important. They're vital and they're healthy. But we also need to think about, okay, but what what's the alternative mm-hmm. then? What's the alternative to, well, life just sucks and you know, <laughs> everything's going to be bad forever? Um, what You have to have something to point your compass toward because the alternative is just nihilism. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean paint everything with rose-colored glasses. You know, in my work, I don't always you know, tell you the story of, and everything was okay. Sometimes it was, you know, like bad things happen to my characters, scary things happen to my characters, but I always take this time to show you what happened after that. The world goes on that people healed or are healing, um, that something very unjust might've happened, but like, we're going to figure out to how to make sure that that doesn't happen next time. You know, I, I, I try to, depict a forward motion always while still being honest about the fact that yes life is hard and life is painful and life is often unfair but um that doesn't mean we should throw in the towel it means that actually the most important thing the most vital thing we can do is to continue to hope even if it's bleak and even if we're wrong maybe even especially if we're wrong you know i would i would much rather go down swinging than (laughs) um you know just give up yeah, I mean, for me personally, I'm on the same page. I have a son, and so for me, everything regarding the future comes from the lens of uh, my optimism for what I can pass on to him, and and the way that I can teach him about this world in the sense of like, yeah, like you said, we are part of the natural world, and and the rhythm of that is cyclical, and so for us, there are certain things that we can fight against and we can push against, but in the end, it might be against our our human nature. It might be against the uh, the natural flows of of the world around us. And so, you end up just bashing your head and getting more and more pissed off and more pessimistic. And eventually, that just becomes a self defeating narrative. And so, I think it's much better to have um, you know obviously challenges that arise because challenges are are commonplace in any given life. But you know, to understand that. I can overcome these challenges. I can get better. And sometimes you just need to chill the fuck out and make a cup of tea and think about what's going on in your life and think about the best way to navigate that and and be able to apply your personal talents or at least your uh, positivity to the community around you, the people around you, your family, your friends, whatever. And that kind of thing has like a uh, an upward trickle effect, I think, as opposed to pessimism, yeah. which has a downward trickle effect. Absolutely. And I think it's where rest and comfort are so important. You know, we talk about them as if they're luxuries and they're not. They're absolutely vital because the truth of the matter is it's always going to be a struggle. There will never be a day where the good guys win and the bad guys lose, like whoever that even is, because that (laughs) definition changes all the time. We will always be fighting and we will always have to work and we will always experience grief. Um, and that's just life. But yeah. that makes it all the more important to stop and look at the beauty around you and to take a nap and let somebody make you a cup of tea <laughs> and like read a book, obviously, again, biased in that regard, but do whatever, play a video game, you know, like go for a walk. Like these things we, we look at as these, you know, little fluffy things in our day. No, that is what gets you through the fight. You have to stop. You have to rest. You have to take some time to engage in some with something that fills you up and makes you feel warm inside or else you're not going to be able to keep going because it isn't going to stop. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, you know, the ending of a song for the wild build and the ending of a prayer for the crown shy just left me feeling like, cool, you know, like, um, life is open-ended and, and sometimes things are unsatisfying, but you can find small comforts in, in those, those brief moments, those brief glimpses of, you know, the world around you or a shared moment with a friend or a cup of tea, whatever it is, you know, and I really appreciate you for writing fiction like this because amidst everything that is going on, 
it is necessary sometimes to just understand, like, <sighs> take a step back, relax. Not everything is shit. I mean, for some people, it is like yeah. hellish. <laughs> you know, I cannot, I cannot deny yeah. that. Uh, but embrace what you have and fight towards something better. But, but appreciate the small moments that, like you said, get you through the mire, the muck, whatever, whatever is pushing against your, your, uh, uh, your will to, to push forward and, and just, uh, live a life that is satisfying or, you know, at least positive. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, absolutely. For you, um, did you have an idea of, uh, after you finished a prayer for the crown shy, of how the series will continue, might continue. What's your what's your thought process about that? For right now, I've I for right now I'm leaving it where it's at. Um, not to close the door on it forever, but like I'm as mentioned, I'm mm-hmm. re- working on something else right now. And I I felt like Dex and Mosscap. I was like, I'm ready to let you just sit for a while. You two can sit and just keep talking. And I'm going to go over here and when you're done talking and when you want to share something with me, you know, we'll, we can, we can see where to go from there. So I don't have any immediate plans for it right now. Um, mm-hmm. just in that my, 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 my brain is, is working elsewhere at the moment. Uh, that's awesome. And I feel like that's, yeah, that's very appropriate for, uh, Moscap and, and Dex's story is like, they mm-hmm. are living, you know, a philosophical uh rumination on on what it means to be and things are open-ended and it's appropriate that you left the story in an open-ended way that could allow you the perfect reintroduction when whenever they just tap into your into your head and say hey we got more stuff to tell let's go yeah exactly exactly that's awesome and just to close out uh what are you currently reading watching playing or listening to, but also on the topic of tea, what is your favorite uh, kind of tea? Oh gosh. Okay. Well, let's go. We'll, we'll start with the the easier questions. What am I reading right now? I just finished <laughs> reading. Uh, I just finished Spear by Nicola Griffith, which was fantastic. It was so good. Um, it was one of those where, like, you know, the feeling where you just kind of hold the book against your face when you're done with it. And you're just like, ah, oh, so good. Um, it was great. Uh, what am I playing? I'm actually in between games at the moment. I just finished up Tunic, which was awesome. Ooh, I loved cool. it. I'm a big, I'm I'm huge into puzzle games and that just scratched the itch for me so hard. I loved it. Um, nice. It was difficult, but in again, in that <laughs> way that really got me going. Um, what am I watching? Man, I'm just bet- I'm in between things right now. Now I'm realizing this. I need to I need to fix this. I'm I haven't I don't actually have anything that I'm watching currently. Uh my wife and I were both huge Star Trek fans and we've been meaning to start Strange New Worlds and that's next on the docket, but um I have a new TV that I haven't hooked up yet because I've been reading a book which I don't think is <laughs> It's not a bad problem. No, 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 but that's that's next on the list for me. Listening to uh I'm a big Florence and the Machine fan and nice. Dance Fever just came out a few weeks ago and I've been I I mean it was a few weeks ago, but it doesn't mean I've stopped listening to it. It's really good. Yeah. Um so <laughs> what is my favorite tea? This is an impossible question because uh it <laughs> depends so much on my mood and the time of day. I feel I feel very strongly that there are certain teas yeah. that you should only have like right before bed and other things. So it really depends. I would say my the my biggest go-to is peppermint as just sort of a general like any time of day like i buy a huge bag i buy it in like giant bags um and uh so you know more often than not if i can't make a decision i will go for peppermint i (laughs) typically drink chicory before bedtime uh and yeah i mean let's see i've been really favoring this lavender berry tea that i have this week i get on different kicks the other week it was turmeric and sometimes it's ginger i don't know like it's <laughs> it's all over the place i will say though i t- i drink um primarily herbal just because uh which i know is not a true tea but like um but look, it's a tea it's fine um but i am the only writer in the world who does not like caffeine so um unless it's decaf i'm i'm tend towards 
the herby stuff which is fun anyway like i love the way it looks i love the way that loose leaf herbal tea looks i feel like i'm brewing a potion um so <laughs> yes that's my terrible answer to what's my favorite tea because i don't have one they're all good it's like the most difficult question of this entire interview <laughs> but i'm on the same page it was, as you this i was love the herbal hardest tea. thing i'm so glad you saved it for last or else that's all <laughs> i would have been doing was sitting here going god how do i explain the oh, nuances shit, of so my many tea collection <laughs> <laughs> but my wife, my wife recently bought this, uh, it's lavender chamomile and it's just such, it's like, Ooh. a dr it's like a dreamy bedtime concoction. It's beautiful, but that sounds so good. I actually, I have a brand new tea downstairs that I'm going to try after this. It's just straight up rose petals, which sounds Ooh. insane to me. I've never tried this, but I really wanted something that felt like getting punched in the face by a bouquet. So I'm, I'm going to see, <laughs> um, how that works out for me. <laughs> Well, that's a perfect note to end on, a punch in the face with a bouquet. Um, <laughs> Becky, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today and hanging out. And I recommend everyone go pick up uh, A Prayer for the Crown Shy uh, when that hits stores. Uh, obviously, it's available on Amazon and everything, but please support your brick and mortars if you can. And yeah, uh, thank you so much. If you could please let uh, people know where they can find you on social media and keep up with your work. Absolutely. It's very easy. I'm not on social media, but you can find me on my website, <laughs> otherscribbles.com. I have a very occasional newsletter that goes out letting you know about events and launches and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but otherwise, I'm an internet hermit. So it's it, that's the one-stop shop <laughs> where you can find me. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, Becky, thank you so much. I really uh, had a good time chatting with you. Likewise, this was a real pleasure.